there, Omaha. Welcome into another episode of Restaurant Hoppin'. I'm your host, Dan Hoppin', and anyone who knows me knows that I enjoy a glass of great whiskey. And I love a bar that offers not only a great quantity and a great selection of whiskeys, but ones that are of very high quality. And that's what I love about my guests today. Their establishment not only has a high quality whiskeys and other spirits, but their bartenders can make some killer cocktails. That's why I can't wait to chat with these guys today. Joel Lavelle and Andrew Klo. Guys, welcome to the show. Hey, thank oh, you. Thanks, thank you. Dan. I appreciate it. Uh, if I were a professional, I would probably mention that you're with Proof. That, that, <laughs> that's the establishment that we're talking about today. I somehow forgot to leave that in my intro. But yeah. Proof, that's what we're talking about today. And, I, and I'm excited. So since we have multiple voices on the podcast today, I would love for each of you to introduce yourselves and maybe just give us a quick description of your role in the company. Uh, my name is Joel Lavelle. Um, I'm the owner of uh, both proof locations, uh, the one in Elkhorn and the one in Midtown Crossing. My name is Andrew Klo. Um, I'm the lead bartender over at Proof 192 out in Elkhorn. Um, yep, that's, that's my role. <laughs> Perfect. So obviously, when someone in Omaha is deciding where they want to go have a drink, what bar they want to go to, tons of options throughout the city. In your eyes, what kind of sets proof apart and makes it something unique and special? Um, I think our selection has a lot to do with it. Um, You can come there, whether you're a beer drinker, wine drinker, you love your cocktails, uh, you're looking for to try different types of whiskey. Also, um, you know, we're not a super loud bar, so people can sit there, have a conversation. Uh, And while it's nice and it's classy and elegant, but at the same time, we kind of have that cheers feel where you can walk in, whether you're in a hoodie, you're in a suit, uh, you're going to a wedding, coming from a wedding, you just want to hang out with friends. Um, you know, and we've built a lot of really cool relationships with a lot of really great people at both locations. And so that kind of makes it special because there's a bunch of people that we get to see that we're just, ex- just as excited as uh, uh, they're being there as we are being there with them. So, You know, and on top of that, you know, we, we also use – I'd say what really stands apart as far as being a bartender, um, on the bartending side of things, we use fresh quality ingredients with all of our cocktails. Uh, nothing has like an additive flavor or anything into it. So what we do are putting into our cocktails, you know, you're getting the best quality ingredients we could possibly get to put into them. So, you know, it really shines through. I always say um, the better the quality, the better the cocktail you'll get at the end of the day. So that's what we always try to do over at 192. So. Yeah, and you know, like Andrew and the the rest of the crew, uh, they do a really great job of doing custom drinks too. Um, you know, you might hear some bartenders, "Oh gosh, I hate making this," and they're like, "Oh yeah, tell me something you want to be made." You know, and they'll just whip it up and they'll come up with creations on the spot. And they're really, really good. Um, it's quite impressive to watch them. Actually, it's kind of funny to watch Andrew think every once in a while he's like, oh, <laughs> going to do. <laughs> it's, it's a slow process, but we try to do it every once in a while. Okay, give me a story, Andrew, and this could be whatever pops to the front of your head, whether this is like a really wild uh, ask that a customer made or maybe, you know, a customer kind of gave you some, you know, kind of funky parameters and you were able to come up with a drink where you were just like, yes, I nailed that one. Give me a story of like custom cocktail and w- whatever comes to the front of your mind. You know, the, the my favorite story, uh, my buddy Tyler actually uh, came to me and he was like, you know, um, we have a gender reveal. Um, me and my wife don't know what what what, what we're going to be having. Uh, we, all we know is we're going to have a twins. So uh, if you could come up with a boy and girl cocktail, we're going to come in tonight. I'm going to give you the envelope. And uh, at the end, we'll, we'll have an awesome reveal, you know. You know, it comes to find out that the twins were both a boy and girl. So <laughs> at the end of the thing, it was, of it was, it was a pretty uh, big shocker when I kind of brought out both color cocktails. And they were looking at me like... Okay, so which one is? I'm like, oh, it's both, you guys. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a really, really uh, fun opportunity to, you know, become part of somebody's family uh, as long as them coming and being part of our family as well, too. So I go, that's one thing that we love about Proof. And, you know, most of our regulars have become more than just regulars. They become friends. They become a part of our lives. And we try to become a part of their lives and make it special too. So Yeah, the amount of people that we've seen on first dates there that ended up getting engaged there that are now married and have kids, it's fun. The last seven years have been awesome. Yeah. It's always a ever ever growing change, but you know, it's one of those things that we're always uh it's 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 exciting to see all the time. So 
exciting to see all the growth out in Melcorn and all the new faces and all the old faces that continue to come see us all the time. So, mm -hmm. And yeah, this is where I want to point out, you guys both kind of mentioned it, but I want to just, in case anyone's listening to this and, be, and they're like, man, I got to check this place out. Proof has two locations, one Midtown Crossing, that was the or just Midtown, sorry, uh, not, not Mid Midtown. Midtown Crossing, Crossing. that yes. was the original. Yes, uh, that, that opened in, on June 1st in 2017. Yes, and then the other one, 192nd and Maple. Yep, and we had the very fortunate timing of uh, opening uh, end of January of 2020, so we had about a solid six weeks before we got a shutdown notice. And we'll talk about that. We'll get into that. But right. you said something really interesting, Joel, that I, I want to hit on a little bit more, and that you said... You want to create a space where not only is it kind of quiet, but like where everyone feels welcome, where somebody can come in wearing a suit or they can come in wearing a hoodie and they feel like they're in place. And I find that so interesting because I, I've had restaurant owners on the podcast who've said the same thing, like whether you're going to a business lunch or you're celebrating your anniversary or you're just taking the kids out to eat. We want everyone to feel like they can be in this space and not feel out of place. How do you do that in a bar? How do you create that atmosphere? Well, I think at a place like Proof, um, everyone there is kind of there for one common reason. Either they love whiskey or they love cocktails. And so I, you, you will see people that are in a hoodie and jeans talking to a guy that's in a very, very nice suit. And, you know, they're just talking cocktails. They have that common – they have that uh, – they have that common ground between shared them. bond. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and we just treat people the same, you know, no matter what um, big golden rule person, you know, everyone gets treated with respect. Everyone gets treated the same. Uh, you, you know, uh, I'm not really sure on the best way to kind of describe it, how I feel about it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I love talking to people. I love people in general. Um, so, and I think most of the staff does too. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of how I hire is based off of how easy it is to have a conversation. And I kind of go off the walls in a, in an interview process. And, you know, as long as they can have a conversation and about those different topics, I think they'll be okay. And I think everybody's ability to listen or want to listen to who's in and have a conversation with them really helps drive that wedge or not, not that wedge, but, uh, drive that culture that we're going for, um, that allows everybody to come in. So, and that plays into directly what I wanted to ask you about next beautiful segue. And that when someone comes in to proof, one of the first things they're going to notice is just this giant wall behind the bar that just has hundreds of bottles. I mean, mm -hmm. it is an impressive display, but for someone who's not a whiskey expert, it could also be really intimidating. Cause they're just like, um, I have no idea. There's so, you know, so much selection can almost cause paralysis how do you make that a comfortable environment for them and kind of, you know, how do you talk to them and say, hey, you know, you don't need to be intimidated. Let me help you find the perfect drink for you. You know, honestly, there's a, there's certain questions you ask for to every person, whether, do you know, have you, are you really, are you really just a novice into whiskey? Are you trying to get your footsteps into the door? You know, what whiskeys have you had? Which whiskeys turned you, you know, turned you off from whiskey in the beginning. So, you know, you try to gather all that information and use kind of, in my opinion, I'm a whiskey nerd. So I, I've tried almost all the whiskeys on our wall at this point in the game. So, you know, when somebody's asking me and telling me what they typically like to drink, whether it be cream in their coffee or they like a, a dark coffee, I mean, those type of questions help answer cocktail questions, whether it be Oh, we like a sweeter whiskey or I like a softer whiskey. I like a hotter whiskey, you know, and you kind of go and you kind of help them, uh, you know, guide through those little adventures. And we usually will find you something that's right in that perfect wheelhouse for you. If not, we'll throw it in the cocktail and make it even better for you. So, so, and yeah, and the people that really don't know what they like to drink yet, uh, usually I recommend doing a flight. So you mm -hmm. get a half ounce of five mm -hmm. different whiskeys and then, you know, just kind of walk them through real quick. Don't overwhelm them with more information than they need at the time. Um, and then once you kind of find which one their favorite is, you can kind of ex like work off of that. Be like, oh, your favorite favorite was rye. So let's build off your rye and your high rye bourbons. And mm -hmm. then you can be like, so next time you come in, uh, let us know you want to do like a rye flight. 
and we'll set up a rifle flight. And then we can keep going and building off of that information. Uh, another one with cocktails is, is sometimes people are like, you know, I was, I'm not sure what I want. So I'll just do a vodka soda. And then you can kind of get into the questions of, do you like sour? Do you like sweet? Do you like earthy? Do you like herbal? And, you know, kind of steer them in the right direction. Um, some of that takes some training and kind of listening to people and kind of watching their face because you can tell they want to order something else. They just have 100%. no idea what to order. And I totally get it. Um, we try to keep our menu descriptions as simple as possible. Um, you know, like we, we talk about them a little bit differently, like the ingredients that go into them, but we just try to make it understandable for everybody. Cause sometimes like I'll go into a restaurant, I'm like, I have no idea what any of this means. Just give me the steak. We'll be good. <laughs> so just try to uh, kind of create an experience and create uh, their decision-making based on the knowledge that we can provide them. Yeah. Now, how do you guys become, I don't know if expert is the right word, but how do you familiarize yourself with all these different whiskeys and all these different spirits? So, you know, when you're asking these questions and somebody says, I like cream in my coffee, or I like a little bit more bitter when it comes to alcohol, like, so you know what to recommend. That's a training of your palate process. Um, it takes a long time. Uh, it's not over. Now you're going to learn how to do this. Um, you know, I've been bartending for roughly almost 15 years now. So at this point in the game, uh, you start to pick on things and you start to pick up things that you get to train your palate by doing. Um, in my instance, throughout time, I've tried different whiskeys to try to bring out different flavor profiles that I know are predominantly popular in those whiskeys. I've always said Jim Beam's always had more of a nuttier profile. So when I've always tried that whiskey, I always thought in the back of my head, well, this is going to have a more of a nuttier profile to it. So you go through all these whiskeys, you try them all. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you start to pick up these little nuances of different flavors, different uh, different little techniques you could use by either breathing in um, one not side of your nostril, your predominant side, or not. Um, you switching it around your mouth. There's different aspects to it that you could pick up the different flavor profiles for it. But uh, typically, that's how you, uh, I guess, I would do it personally. I saw your interest spark when you said uh, predominant nostril. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that that is just wild to me. I would have never thought that that. So next influenced. time you're having like a glass of wine or a glass of whiskey or even a cocktail, um, clog one of your nostrils and like two inches away, smell, and then switch over. Uh, whichever one you pick up like ethanol alcohol in, that's your weak nostril. That's a dominant. It's a dominant smell. It's very apparent. Everyone can get it. Um, the one you'll start picking up underlying tones is going to be your dominant. So you'll start to get kind of the fruits and the caramels and things like that. Um, and then once you kind of got that down on how to smell, if you start opening your mouth and breathing through your nose and your mouth at the same time, you'll get some on your palate. And so like when you read those crazy descriptors on the back of bottles, 80% of that is coming from what they smell and get on their palate through smell. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So it's one of the things we teach like when we're doing whiskey tastings. That's like fascinating. That. Yeah. I had no idea that we had predominant nostrils. You oh, guys yeah. just taught me something new this morning. <laughs> you got predominant everything. Ear, eye, arm, leg. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So talk about a little bit about the the grand selection that you guys have. Obviously, you're going to have, you know, all the familiar standbys. You mentioned Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, you know, uh, probably Evan Williams, you know, just the familiar ones like that. Absolutely. But, but when it comes to, you know, all these other whiskeys that, you know, you can find from all over the country, all over the world, how are you finding those and, you know, figuring out, is this something that we want to offer at Proof? Um, a lot of it has to do um, with our distributor teams. Um, they keep us pretty informed on what's coming to the market. They'll be like, hey, in six weeks, this is coming. Um, do you want to be on the list to get it? Of course. Um, some stuff we research, some stuff like when we're out of town and we see stuff in different markets, we kind of start pushing distributors to try to bring it in, um, to see if we can't get it. Um, and then, uh, you know, there, there is a tasting process, usually like me, him and one other person, we try to do it like right around three. So when we have some people starting to come in, we have them try it and see what their thoughts are. Kind of ask them, do you think it's worth this amount of money for this bottle or so mm -hmm. forth and so on. So we try to get everyone's kind of opinion. Um, and we're kind of at the point where we don't have room on our shelves anymore. So like we're having to start to be kind of selective on what we're bringing in and what we're not. Uh, but for the most part, we try to bring in as much as we possibly can. There's a few bottles that we could bring in that we don't, but the cost is like years of my mortgage payment. 
So we're just going to leave those mm-hmm. alone for a while. That's fair, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I had uh, David Mark Young, who is the owner of Golden Sheaf oh, Whiskey. Yeah. I had him on the podcast him. a couple months ago. Great dude. with yep. a fantastic conversation. But one of the most interesting things he said to me that I'd never considered, kind of like the dominant nostril thing, was that he has to be very careful in his job of tasting whiskey so he doesn't burn out his palate. A billion percent. <laughs> because yep. if he does that, obviously that affects his his job for days, if not weeks. How do you guys protect against that? You know, when you're talking about trying different ways, and you said it slowed down a little bit because the shelves are getting full. But how yep. do you like actively protect against that to make sure that your palate is functioning at its top level? Um, like if you know you're gonna try stuff, like you don't want to have too much coffee, you don't want to have a bunch of spicy food yep. you don't want to have like any really dominant flavors of that day so the best time to try things like if you want the freshest palate is right first thing in the morning you don't have like really anything to eat yet um because as you eat things get stuck in your palate or in your teeth and your mouth and uh they'll influence what the flavors are uh but that's one way and then you just don't overdo it either you don't yep. try to like when we kind of limit like our tastings, for example, at five, because really anything over that, uh, it's going to kind of drown out your palate and you've been drinking a little bit and everything starts to taste good. Hence why <laughs> Taco Bell is very popular Absolutely. at three o'clock in the morning, you know, <laughs> you know, and there's also different ways of like when we're doing our tastings, uh, we'll take it from lowest proof to highest proof. Uh, that way you're not drowning out the proof by getting when the higher proofs and every stuff, stuff like that will drown out the flavor of the lower proofs. Um, honestly, I've always, like Joel said, the best way is moderation. It really, really does do wonders for your palate. I'd say four to five whiskeys. And after that, you're pretty much tasting the same thing after that. So it is a very, very good key to keep it at that low consistency. Um, David's palate's a a little bit different because he's deciphering what his product's going to taste like. Yes, correct. Um, we are trying to decipher what multiple products taste like. Yeah. to the audience so and if we want um, to bring it to our audience mm-hmm. as well too so. so yeah with him he needs he needs to be very very careful he needs to have a very very fine-tuned palette because he needs his product to be very consistent um obviously what we're offering is very like with the what's on the wall it's a very inconsistent flavor uh pattern so you know with his yes he needs to be very careful um on not to burn out his palate because palate burnout is horrible where you just don't taste anything for days at a time. And it yeah, kind of sucks. I can imagine. Yeah. Especially in this industry, it, you know, you're dealing with stuff with a little bit higher alcohol content. It really does start to take its effect on your palate and body itself. So yeah, once you start trying 140, 150 <laughs> proof bourbons, it, uh, it takes its toll. It really does. It really does. Okay. I got to ask you guys about old fashions. Yes. Because A, that's my favorite cocktail. B, it's probably, if not the most popular whiskey cocktail, it's one of them. And every bar needs to have like their signature. I, I feel like, you know, something that makes their old fashioned theirs. So the proof old fashioned is the the barrel picked old fashioned, which combines a a private barrel selection, a cedar smoke glass, black walnut bitters, and an orange twist. As you guys were coming up with this, you know, you're deciding this is going to be our signature version of the old fashioned. How did you arrive on that recipe and that description? Um, Our smoked cocktails are super, super popular. Um, So that was part of the decision to make it more of what uh, embodies what a proof cocktail is or a proof old fashioned is. Um, Given it's our private selection, those barrels are specific to us which also gives it a specific uh, flavor profile. The black walnut bitters, great on the palate, really rounds out really well. Um, And obviously the orange twist with the bourbon brings out the caramel profiles a little bit, brings out the smoke a little bit sweeter. Uh, So that's kind of where our thought process went with that. Plus it's a little bit different with every barrel selection. So obviously not every whiskey tastes the same. So every time we get a new whiskey in, it's a little bit different. Um, sometimes we switch up the bitters here and there, uh, especially for people when they're like, Hey, I have a nut allergy. Obviously we're not going to throw black walnut bitters in their cocktail. Absolutely. Um, sometimes we throw like a Turkish tobacco bitters in there. And or it a little bit of them. chocolate bitters or yeah. a little bit of orange. There's a, there's a whole bunch of fun stuff that we can we yeah. always play around with. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, people are just like, make me up 
what you think your best old fashioned is. And, you know, we'll kind of take the premise of the um, barrel pick old fashioned and build off of that. And, you know, uh, that's kind of how we did it. We tried to stay with the classic style where the idea is to highlight the whiskey and the old fashioned is not to drown out the whiskey in the old fashioned. So usually that's our goal with all three old fashions on the menu. You know, this kind of breaks down with almost all of our cocktails, but this is especially goes towards the barrel pick old fashioned. If it's not something that I personally wouldn't want to drink one or two of, I, we probably won't put it on our menu. So yeah. it is a very, very strong feeling I have towards our barrel pickle fashion. It was created because we thoroughly, thoroughly sat down and enjoyed one. And I said, you know what? This is definitely something this that should it. be. Um, yeah. This is it. Well, we, so. make, we make all our cocktails a lot of different ways. And we try them a lot of different ways. And there's stuff in theory that was amazing. And yeah. just, you know, and there's stuff that we can make that's like phenomenal but on a production level it's like impossible. when we're we're super busy it's just like this is going to mess everything up so we can't put it on the menu which is a shame and sometimes we try to engineer it in a way that we can put it on the menu but it doesn't always work um so that's kind of one of our deciding factors of what constitutes what goes on to the menu yeah well, tell me more about the cocktail r d process like what what's the what are the steps that need to be taken from conceptualizing a cocktail until it hits the menu that's a great question yeah. um honestly it's it's a lot of trial and error like uh joel was saying it's it's more one of those things you you try to get inspiration through other sources whether it be TikTok, whether it be facebook whether it be instagram you know and you try even it goes to my i'm a foodie so i love food so when i'm looking at these delicious things that I want to eat, but you know, I'm on my diet, but I, so I want to make it into a cocktail. I want something I could just get a sip of really quick and get, get, get it over with. Um, the key lime pie cocktail for this new cocktail menu was mine. Um, yeah. you know, that was something that I love key lime pie. It's one of my favorite desserts in the world. So I was like, you know, let's make it into a cocktail. So it's just those fun little ideas. And you, I got my wife at home and she likes to help me out with uh coming up with these ideas and she gets to be the lucky one to try it out too so yeah, you know and and one thing we teach to newer and we also preach when people are creating new cocktails is what's the front palette what's the mid palette what's the finish what's the body is there balance like if you have those five things like put in your cocktails gonna be great um now great's gonna be very subjective because not everyone likes the same flavors which is what makes this a lot of fun uh but, you know, those are five things to the key. And then it's like, how pretty does it look? You know, um, it, you know, you can't have it coming out like some weird color or something like that. And it just doesn't the look pink, good. The pink cocktail. I yeah. had some questions. I was like, what went into that? I wonder. But <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so, it, you know, so usually we have the bar staff. I'll try it. Um, so everyone kind of tries it, gives them their thoughts. And then once we get there. Usually I tell them like, well, make a few pour into sample glasses, uh, like Glenn Karen's and just pass them out to like 10, 12 people and ask them for their honest opinion, you know? And if they tell you it sucks, it, it sucks. Yeah. You know, yeah. it well, is what it is. Like, and we take, do take criticism yeah. very, very serious. I mean, we have no problem submitting that a cocktail of ours doesn't, shouldn't be yeah. on that menu. Uh, so it's I, happened multiple times. So, yeah. Yep, and I thought I had a great cocktail. I was thinking about one night. I'm like, God, I can't wait to make that in the morning and, you know, put it together and we try it. I'm like, that's trash. What was like, it? Uh, I was kind of trying to recreate like a kind of like a peanut butter coffee with like a little bit of bacon flavor. All those things together sound wonderful. But like when you start introducing what makes it tough is when you introduce that alcohol burn and that flavor, it changes everything. And with us only using real ingredients and uh, fresh ingredients and things like that. Um, that also changes things a little bit because you just, yeah, sometimes it comes out a little mealy or it can come out just difficult, you know? And so that one, that one was a bummer. I thought that was going to be great, but now it like it took one sip and I was like, Nope, never again. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just knew it wasn't going to work no matter what I did. So fair enough. Yep. So something that I'm really interested in is at a restaurant, every cook, sous chef, you know, uh, the line cook, whatever it might be, they, they are taught how to create dishes by the executive chef and they have a knowledge of this is how this dish is supposed to be created. But every cook has their own individual palate. They mm -hmm. have different experiences. They have different mentors that they've worked at in different restaurants. So even subconsciously, 
there might be small changes in how they prepare a dish or how much salt they use in a dish or something that makes a dish slightly different, you know, from when you got it last time, if you order it again. Is it the same with bartenders or like, do you allow for a little bit of personality with bartenders or is it more of an exact measure it science? So when we hire people, um, we, we teach them, this is how we make our cocktails. There's no variant on the cocktail unless that someone requests it. Um, you know, but when it comes to making their own, we encourage that 110%. Make what you feel is best, trial and error, do your research you know, make up specials for people, do all that. But when it comes to the menu cocktails, they need to be close as possible to the same every single time. Um, sometimes there's little changes that we do make, like as a team um, along the way, you know, whether it be sometimes like the limes that you're getting don't create the best juice, you know, so you have to change that up a little bit or, you know, something, uh, you know, along those lines. Uh, there's always a variable. But on the bartender side of things, everything is measured out. So everything is very, very consistent. Um, uh, sometimes like Dion, for example, will make these really kind of crazy garnishes and that might be his personal touch, for example, but bottom line, the taste will always be right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I will say it's, uh, we, we have a batching process too, of a way of getting it very consistent too across the board. As far as the bartenders go, we have one person that makes all of our batches and we have everything that, you know, helps us mm -hmm. with creating our main, uh, mainstay cocktails that every single time you'll go from proof 192, you want to drive all the way down to midtown before you go home, you want to have another cocktail, that cocktail at that bar will taste the exact same as the bar and one you had at our bar. So we don't want you to feel like you're missing out by going to one bar and you're, that you're not getting something at the other bar. We all have the same, you know, we really have the same common goal of making everybody the, a great cocktail that tastes the exact same as the place that money had at the other one. So what is your favorite cocktail that you've created? Ooh, uh, my favorite is probably the bourbon berry crunch. Um, I felt like that one was what's in it. Uh, that one has a uh, creme de sauce, bourbon, a little bit of lime juice, honey, and uh, shandon. So, ooh, okay, yeah, yeah, smoked with a cinnamon it's stick, smoked too. cinnamon stick. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful cocktail. It tastes kind of like a smoked cinnamon blackberry. So, yeah. how'd you come up with it? Uh, that one was honestly just me and my wife were come wanted to come up with a blackberry sour cocktail um through trial and error we found that creme de saucis was the answer and uh kind of helped out with that whole process with it so it it, it, it it like i said it is a process i went through making blackberry syrup tried blackberry jam i've, I've tried everything but it finally landed on that one so it is kind of cool going through those trial and errors. And when you finally do come up with that one cocktail and you get that first sip and it's in, like the lightning, lightning bolt pits, you know, all the fireworks start going off and it's like, okay, I finally hit the home run. So it is cool finally doing it. It is achieving that final moment. It's really, really nice. So, all right, let's get into Proof's backstory. Joel, I know you've had a long career in the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. At what point did you get the ambition to open your own bar? Um, so the idea actually when I was like 20, 20 years old is like, I want to open restaurants and bars. That's what I want to do. And, uh, I kind of got away from the restaurant side of things. Um, when I was about 25, 26, I kind of wanted to get away from food because when I was going out, I was noticing there wasn't really any nice, comfortable laid back lounges uh, around town that weren't cigar bars and don't get me wrong. I love my cigar bars, but, uh, but there just re really wasn't like any, like that, anything like that, um, around town. So, uh, that's kind of where I wanted to bring like a steakhouse style and, uh, quality style to the table, uh, without the food dynamic to it. So that's kind of what got me into it and, uh, into the whiskey and craft cocktail game. Uh, now the whiskey I got into because I enjoy drinking whiskey, but you know, so, uh, uh, but when I was 29 years old is when we're working on getting proof open and opened it right before my 30th birthday, which was my goal. So I was actually pretty pleasantly surprised that I was able to do that. So, and 
uh, obviously we've evolved quite a bit since we first opened in 2017. Um, uh, the help of a lot of great team members and a lot of great people, um, a lot of great guests, uh, everything like that. So, How do you think you've evolved the most? Um, I'm not, I, I don't get uh, as stressed out as much um, on a personal level. Um, the bar level, uh, I think we've evolved the most on, I was able to hire a lot of great people like Andy here, um, you know, Chris down in Midtown, Jackie, Joni, Dion, um, and everyone else I'm not saying, but they're all great. So like hiring all these individuals that bring something very strong to the table um, has been probably my biggest benefit. My goal is to always bring people on that are better than me. So, um, and I think that's been our biggest involvement uh, is to allow them to shine, allow them to get some stuff into and really let the personality of proof shine through. So you talk about that personality of proof. I want to bring a couple taglines that you've got on the website here one is just front and center on your website it says prohibition era style meets urban upscale and then there's another line elsewhere on the website it says we've combined the atmosphere and craftsmanship of centuries past and modern technology unpack those things like how do you if you're describing proof's personality to somebody for the first time, how, how do you go about that? So our classic cocktails are going to be the pre-prohibition era. So like if you go through our menu and you'd see, you know, old fashioned and then parentheses would say 1888. That was the original documented recipe for the old fashioned. So that's going to go to that older style. Now to the urban style, um, that's going to be in the Midtown Crossing area. Obviously, you got big buildings everywhere along with you. Um, and if when you walk in, you'll kind of notice we do have that classic vibe with all the woodwork, but we still kind of kept that kind of that urban decor with the steel beams in there, too. So we brought that all together. Um, now, with uh, more of that uh, classic vibe is we don't have super loud music. Um, we just have a couple TVs. Uh, the lights are a little bit darker. Uh, the back bar glows real well. Um, and, and then you're also talking about a lot of these whiskey companies that have been around two, three, four, five hundred 500 years in some cases. So, now You mentioned that the Midtown location opened in 2017. Correct. What was it about that area of town that was attractive to you? Um, Turner Park is a big one right there. All the events they're doing. Um, you have Mutual of Omaha right there. Uh, you have First National Bank. You have Peter Kiewit. Um, you have all that stuff down there. Um, really, really cool area. Space was great. Um, it was nice, romantic, warm. Uh, so that's kind of what brought us there. And so then when we moved out to Elkhorn, it's cause I live in Elkhorn and I just wanted something a little bit closer to home, but no, I, uh, we heard a lot of people saying that we love coming down, but you know, they couldn't drive the 25 mile round trip every single time. And, you know, um, as soon as I was able, I got Elkhorn up and running. So before we get to Elkhorn, I want to go back to the Midtown location. Take me back to opening night in 2017. What do you remember most? Like what memory pops to the front of your brain? <laughs> so we actually were doing a soft opening. And right after we announced the soft opening, Midtown had announced doing a night market. If you've been to a night market in Midtown. Mm -hmm. They're very fun. They are. Um, and so we had this giant line out the door. And uh, so I had one of the hosts uh, or uh, – one of I, I hired a host for the night to kind of help us with the invite part, and eventually they started letting everybody in. Oh, <laughs> and it got really, really, really crazy. I walked up, I'm like, "What's going on, man?" And he just he's like, he goes, "I thought you just wanted everybody in." I'm like, "No, it was invite only." And so like we were, you know, two, three deep at the bar, and there wasn't enough seats to sit. It was our first day operating. Um, it wasn't the smoothest in the world, but definitely a learning experience and kind of set the tempo. So like afterwards, and you know, we got through it, and I was like, "All right, guys," I'm like, "Well, that's the stand." if we're gonna be able to get that busy that's what we gotta work <laughs> it's for. never gonna be worse than that <laughs> no exactly so um you know but uh it gave the entire staff uh the idea of what the bar can do what they are able to do what they're able to accomplish and honestly they did really really well for that first night i do remember that which was really impressive um you know now we're used to and accustomed to having those types of nights at both locations where it's just it's fun like you really get into it you're like yeah this is awesome. Yeah. So 100%. Andrew, how did you get hooked up with Proof originally? You know, uh, actually, I went down to Midtown Crossing for a birthday. 
uh, one day. Uh, it was back in 2000, end of 2019, I should say. I uh, went out there um, celebrating with my wife, about to have a drink. And Joel comes up to me, and we were just kind of talking about whiskey. He knew I was a bartender through uh, Nebraska Bourbon Society and uh, all that kind of stuff. And um, we were talking along, and he was like, yeah, I'm about to be opening up a bar out in uh, out in West Omaha. I go, oh, are you looking for a bartender? <laughs> like, <laughs> funny you say that. Are you looking for a bartender? And uh I'm, I'm grateful for every day that I ever said yes to that, just as grateful I am for the opportunity that Joel has provided me. Um, it really is a blessing. You always look back and you wonder how things get started or how, uh, how something just happens. It's just some, sometimes just opening up your mouth and just saying, Hey, I, I'd like to help. It really does just open up doors for you. And I'm some of the doors you really want the most are the ones that you don't expect to happen. So What's your inspiration behind bartending? How'd you get into it? <laughs> bartending, honestly, um, was a server for the longest time over at Oscars. Um, I always just wanted to push myself to be in the management side. Um, over at Oscars, management was bartending. Um, if you're a bartender, you were pretty much a supervisor manager on duty there. So I go in order for me to make more money for my family. I wanted to be a supervisor, a bartender. Um, got me into that. Um, as time progressed, I, you know, I embrace my role as being a bartender. Um, some people don't, and that's a hard struggle. But in my opinion, uh, you embrace whatever you do in life, and you'd be happy with it, and you'll make uh, some tremendous uh, gains in your life. So I embraced bartending, and uh, once, especially once Joel gave me that opportunity, it kind of opened up my eyes of what fine, fine dining bartending can be instead of uh, – you know, what your atypical, what would be dive, considered dive bartending. Um, I, I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I'm able to uh, express my own creativity, uh, express myself through my cocktails. Uh, you kind of get the, a little gist of me every time you come into proof. I always say it's not so cookie cutter uh, where I'm pouring you a beer or I'm getting you a vodka Red Bull. No, you're you're getting a glimpse of really uh, of my personality, whoever else's personality is going into the other cocktails that are being created too. You know, I'm not the only one creating cocktails. We have Dion that's an amazing cocktail artist. I mean, he expresses a lot of his mindset and through that. We got Chris over at Midtown. He's just an amazing artist himself. So, I mean, it's just those guys and girls that we work with, you know, when you come in, you're going to experience something. It's not just, like I said, just a cookie cutter effect where it's not like you're just walking into a sports bar to go watch a game or something. No, you're going to have an experience. And that's what we're trying to create every single time you walk through the door. So tell yeah. me more about that. How do you express yourself through a cocktail? You know, I got the best way you could do it. It's just, you know, uh, that's a good, that's a great question. You just got to watch his face when he's shaking a cocktail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and no, in all reality, you, uh, you kind of want to show a little bit of your, of yourself in a cocktail. Like I've always, I've made some fun ones where I had the Cracker Jack cocktail. I'm a big baseball fan. So, you know, when somebody was like, Oh, where'd you come up with this idea? Like, Oh, well, my son plays baseball and you know, this is where my idea came from. This was of us going to baseball games together, you know, getting those little conversations back and forth and bantering with customers. That's, that's really how you get to express yourself, you know, and they get to get to know you and you get to learn a little bit about them because then they'll tell you a little bit of story about, Oh yeah. Well, me and my dad used to go out to games all the guy all the time. I like, I like the Padres or something like that. You know, it's just, it's fun to be able to start that relationship. And that's kind of how those bridges are kind of met. So, and you can see with each bartender too, like you can kind of see where their passion comes through. Cause like Andy creates like a lot of fruit forward cocktails. Yes. So like, you know, that he like really and kind of enjoys that, that side of the cocktailing. Yeah. Um, you know, like where you see Chris, he gets more, he designs more of like a bitter earthy, a little bit more complicated, like a, uh, he was, he's a chef by trade and like a very good chef by trade. And so like, you can kind of start to see his food mind kind of go through it with some of the syrups and stuff that he creates and the ideas that he brings to the table. So like you can start to kind of tell if you're around enough, um, who's made this up and who made that up. And yeah. So, so when you start to kind of get to know us a little bit, you'll, 
you come in, you'll see, you look at the menu, you'll be like, oh, this is a Dion cocktail, or this is yeah. Andrew's cocktail. Obviously. Oh, really? Or this yeah. is Chris's yeah. cocktail. So, yeah. People, I mean, people know it, like our regulars do. They're like, let me guess who made this. And yeah. I'd and say probably nine times out of 10, they guess correctly. That's fascinating. And yeah. it's fun to be able to do that and be able to create that environment, too. Yeah. So, okay. So, and this is not to say anything bad about Oscars or about any other dive bars or any other places no, no, you've worked absolutely. at. Because those places absolutely have Amazing. their place. I, yeah. I love Oscars. Yeah. But when you talk about like, you know, getting into the fine, you, you said the fine dining side of cocktails. And I thought that was a brilliant way to put it. Mm -hmm. Did you have experience in that previously? Or like what kind of crash course did you have to put yourself through to, to level up your game? It was a crash course. Um, I'm sure Joel had many moments where he was like, I don't know if this kid's going to make it. But, uh, you know, in all reality, it's, it's, it's a learning process. I always say everything is a learning process. Every day is a learning process. There's not a day that I don't learn something new or I won't listen to somebody that might be younger than me that has been doing bartending for not as long as me because guess what? They might have picked up something from somewhere else. Um, I, there was a young a gentleman named Charlie I used to work with us. Uh, we're down in South Carolina. He brought a lot of techniques to prove that a younger bartender – I probably wouldn't have given the time of day back in my old days. Um, so being able to listen to and take compliments and, you know, listen to other people too, it kind of helps you evolve in becoming a, the craft bartender. Um, listening to yourself, you know, saying, hey, man, I, you could do this. There's, there's a whole lot of things that you have to do to go into the whole step of becoming into a craft bartender outside of, being a, just a normal bartender. So, and, you know, I think you trained for like two months before we opened 192. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, like a lot of that's, it, it's, it's based on the personality. You know, if you can see somebody wants to learn, they want to be challenged and stuff like that. Um, that's a, that's a good step into the craft yeah. in the world. And yeah, but, you know, I love my dive bars. I, you know, I go to I, them every single yeah. night, so I, it's I like, they too have often their I have to go to yeah. the gym yeah. every single day <laughs> now to fix it. So, uh, but uh, you know, uh, it's it's kind of one of those things like you either love it or you don't. Um, it is very labor intensive. It is. It can be very challenging at times, um, especially when you're just crazy, crazy busy and you're putting together these four or five, six step cocktails. Um, like to me, that's fun. It's a challenge. It's different. Um, to some people they're like, this is annoying. So, you know, it, it's just all about getting the fit. So, um, you know, and Andy fit into that really, really well when he first started, like he just kind of grabbed the bull by the horns. Um, you know, uh, we've had people where, you know, we brought on and no hard feelings, but they're like, this is too much for me. And yeah. it's cool. Mm -hmm. Like I get it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Like no one's mad about it, you know? So like, uh, our idea is to bring people that are passionate and absolutely love it to the table because that's going to shine through. Like we're talking about personalities in the cocktails. When someone really enjoys what they're doing, you can really see it really kind of comes through. Okay. So. Second location opens in January of 2020 in, mm -hmm. uh, in Elkhorn, 192nd and Maple. We touched briefly on the, the where and the why, but I'm interested in the when. Like, because I, I'm always fascinated with restaurants about when they open a second location, how did they know they were ready? And sometimes they're not ready. And that second location ends up failing. And sometimes it even submarines the first one as well. How did you know proof is established in Midtown? This is something that people love. It's time for location number two. Um, well, there's a brand new development coming through and it was going to be Antler View. And they had approached us and... Uh, they had said, hey, do you want to be out here? And I wanted to be in Elkhorn, and I'd looked at a few other spots in Elkhorn, and it, I just didn't feel like it was a good fit for what we're trying to do, whether it was the size of the uh, space or um, just the overall location. Um, and so that one kind of gave me the shove that I needed because it was like, it's this is a great spot. It's, it's go now or don't, you know. And so went out there, uh, which has been a phenomenal decision, um, you know, shortly after they announced the Elkhorn High School being built, which has been tremendous for us uh, with the population boom in Elkhorn, um, you know, and then we're just surrounded by a, a bunch of great people out there. Um, but I, I figured it was about time when the de demand was getting high from um, West Omaha 
uh, coming down to Midtown, the amount of people I were talking to that were driving down that direction uh, just to come drink. I was like, we need to get something closer that's within that five mile range of their homes, mm -hmm. you know, so we can, you know, kind of push the envelope. And it was, it's about a 20 mile drive from one another. So I didn't feel like we we're going to take away business from each other. And, you know, I think sometimes when people open a second or third location, sometimes they're way too close to each other is a problem. Um, I felt like I had this a, a wonderful staff and I still do down in Midtown where I could step away for a little bit and get this one going. And that's exactly what we were able to do. Now, when you're building proof out, how much do you try and proof 192 excuse me or is it 192 or 192 i think you guys have referred to it as both. Um, well, either way 192 192, 192. 192. Yeah. however you say 192. as you're building out 192 <laughs> how much do you say let's give this place its own unique personality versus let's stay true to like the established proof brand how, how do you balance those two things um you know, I mean, it, it just kind of goes by, you know, what your regular base turns into, you know. Um, you know, there's people I sit down and I talk business with and there's people I sit down and tell jokes with, you know. So uh, it, it just kind of – I try to do my best to let the market dictate what we are because bottom line, they are going to dictate what you are. Um, that goes for pretty much every company. Um, but, it, you know, I just wanted something to make sure it felt personable to everyone that was coming in. So like we kind of have that Elkhorn vibe in Elkhorn and Midtown's got that Midtown vibe in Midtown, but you know, like that's going to go back to who's coming in, you know, uh, the people that are coming in, but, um, to kind of, kind of simplify what I'm trying to say, I guess, is I just wanted to make sure it felt authentic and our bartenders were being who they truly were. And so like most of the bartenders in Midtown live in Midtown. Most of the bartenders in Elkhorn live out in Elkhorn. So, you know, it, it's just kind of like that little pocket neighborhood type deal. So, Have you guys noticed a difference in flavor profiles or palate preferences or anything between the two locations? Yeah. Billion percent. Definitely. Uh, How so? Like, that's fascinating to me. So we saw, like, on the whiskey side of things, we saw a lot more scotch in Midtown. Really? We, we saw a ton more bourbon out west. Yes. Um, on the cocktail side of things, we saw a lot more uh old fashions out west uh we sell a lot more manhattans down in midtown do you know the why behind that at all or is it just i i i, I demographic I really... of ages um you know it's there's the weekends seem to be a little bit more cocktail heavy mm -hmm. towards the midtown side of things whereas the west omaha side of things it's a little bit there's a mix of cocktails and whiskey pours um it's it is very, very interesting to see the difference in the clientele, too. You do have the colleges and everything right around that area that kind of feed into that Midtown Crossing vibe, that younger feel out. Um, you have, um, what is it, the Blackstone, which is a stone throw away from yeah. the Midtown Crossing. So that gives that younger vibes on the weekend. You have that walking around the beautiful views and everything else downtown um people trying to get out so i go that always helps with that um west omaha has its own niche of clients i've always said that uh, they, they love bourbon they love their like old fashions and and i love making those two things so that's that's an awesome <laughs> thing so yeah. marriage yeah. made in heaven it's yeah a, yeah the demographics are fascinating it is. like honestly there's no way to pinpoint them it's 21 and up yeah you know like we had a lady celebrating a 80th birthday in there, you know, it was yep, just her and all her, her and all her friends just slamming down cocktails. Yeah, it's very it was, true. It was Absolutely. great. I was like, God, I hope you guys are Ubering. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, and, but, you know, you see a lot of 21st, 22nd birthdays in there too. Um, yes. And then you see everything in between. Um, you know, we have regulars that are in their mid twenties out at one nine two and whoever they're sitting next to, they'll talk to like, they're talking to the older couple uh a couple nights ago and they actually there was nowhere else to sit and so they invited them to sit at their table so you have these people i've never met before in this mid-20s couple and this mid-70s couple and they sit there and just drink together for two hours and it's really cool to see yeah because like you're okay you're like okay now there's this you know three-way connection here between all three of us which makes it really really fun because they just made new friends um you know you get to see them kind of 
you know, help promote you at the same time because it might be their first time in. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's fun to watch that. It's really fun for me to watch it. Yeah. Okay. So obviously we've talked a lot about what proof has, you know, established what it's built and now what it's evolved to, you know, out in Elkhorn, as you guys look forward into the future of proof, what do you see? Um, you know, uh, I got, I got some things in the works. Um, I don't want to oversaturate the market with proofs. So I would like to get one out in Gretna. I think eventually, um, you know, just kind of waiting for construction costs and loans to come down a little bit before I make that move. Uh, but I think that'd be about it for the Omaha market. I'd like to go into Kansas city. I love Kansas city to me. It's just a bigger Omaha. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of my two year goal is to get those two things at least operational. But I do definitely want to take our time and make sure things get done right, get done correctly. And that we're not expanding too fast where the quality at all the locations starts to decline. Absolutely. All right. I've got two questions left for you guys that I like to ask just about every guest I have on here. And I'm fascinated to hear your answers because you come at it at a different perspective from a lot of chefs and restaurants. First question is this, what is one thing about the bar spirits, um, cocktail industry you think most customers don't understand, but you wish they did understand it? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. That's why I like asking it. Um, man, you're going to make me think on a Monday like this. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm um, sorry. I, so, uh, you, I, I think something, you know, and I take it for granted too sometimes is how much work goes in to creating those menus and just overall getting the place going from, you know, people coming in at eight to, in the morning to start cleaning the four or five hours a week he takes to create all these different syrups, um, you know, to how much time it takes to go through the liquor orders, how much time it takes to research all the trends that are going through. Cause you know, we'll have trends where like we sold five of these cocktails that aren't on the menu, so to speak. Um, you know, in the last week, then all of a sudden an article comes out, we sold 200 <sighs> this next week. So it's, you know, keeping up with that, um, keeping up with making sure the staff's doing okay in their personal lives. So they're happy in their, uh, professional lives and vice versa. Um, you know, and then just trying to make sure you're, you're there for everybody you're working, you know, you're, you're present to say hi and kind of keep up with all your regulars lives as well. As long as keeping on a personal life, it's a lot to juggle. And, you know, uh, you know, sometimes people just don't see it because they see the finished product getting delivered to them. And like I said, I'm guilty of it. You know, like sometimes I sit down and I'm like, I'm like, oh, and I just don't think about it when the food comes that my like, God, somebody's probably here at six o'clock in the morning getting this put together, you know, and I just don't think about that enough. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's just kind of that awareness of what the industry is and how much it's changing uh, right now and how difficult some of this stuff can be to get anymore in the fluctuating prices that are happening to the industry right now. And how hard it is to get people to come in to help and stuff like that. I mean, it's, yeah, we we're running. blessed, blessed, blessed beyond words to have the people that we work with mm -hmm. stick around and, and be here for as long as they have. A lot of us have been with proof for a very, very long time. I think the um, average length right now is about five years. Yeah. That's impressive. Four, four so, years or so. You know, if we didn't have those people, uh -huh. I don't know if anything's ever possible with this. And that's why I would like to say, well, uh, well, wish people would, you know, when you see us, the familiar faces over, uh, you know, the different proofs, it's, you know, it is, it is very, very difficult to always keep the consistent smiles, the always positive attitudes and everything like that. So if we ever do look like we are in a bad mood or not in the, up, you know, best of mood. So that just uh, keep in mind that we're all working as hard as we humanly possibly can, and you know, to try to get the yeah. best. Stuff and if, if we're super busy and we're not like smiling, it's not because yeah. we're not happy. Yeah, it's, it's just because you get you're super, working. You yeah. get super you know, laser focused. Yeah, you get very, very, very focused on what you're trying to do, especially when it comes to this industry. You want the cocktail to come out perfect. Yeah, um, and you know, there's like there's this, that stress. There's this last Saturday night. I think Andy at one point had like 30 cocktails to make and they all came in at the same time. Ugh. So it's just like, it's like, okay, 
it's yeah. like yeah i'm never you know that's the biggest thing i guess is if we're ever if you ever see a bartender with a frown on his face it's probably not because he's mad it's probably because he's because laser focused and ready and trying yeah. to get his job done because you're so. thinking, <laughs> you're thinking you're not thinking about your next step you're thinking about your step five steps down yes you know yeah. because yeah. that's the only way you can kind of maintain that continuity um yeah it's uh you know and yeah, uh, if you walk into a bar or restaurant and you do see the same staff year after year after year after year, that says a lot about you know that, that place is doing it right. They're treating yeah. their people good, and you know that's yeah. you know. And my dad always was very good at teaching me that is your most important asset in, in business in any business is your people. Bottom line, that they're you have to take care of them the yeah. best of your ability. Like they are, they are the most important thing for your business. So I do whatever I possibly can to make sure the entire crew is happy and healthy and they enjoy themselves. They get vacations when they need to and yeah, or want to, so to speak. So, okay. I do have my final question, but something that you just said sparked a tangent that I need the All answer right. to. Cause I, I like to talk to chefs and cooks about what they do when they get in the weeds, when the tickets are just lined up and they're just, they're coming faster than they're getting out of the kitchen. So Andrew, take me into that moment. Like when you've got, <laughs> 30 is probably a little bit of an extreme. I don't assume that happens very often, but when you, when you're every week at night, <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. And when you've got that many orders coming in and you feel yourself getting sped up a little bit, what do you do? How do you keep um, yourself in the moment? I've always told myself when you ever get in the moment where you're starting to panic, that's when you don't panic. Just take a breath, relax, realize you have to get through this to get to the end. So, uh, try, organizing it as what you can make multiple of uh, to help you mm -hmm. conquer multiple tickets at once. Um, so instead of just looking at the first ticket, look at the grand scheme of all the tickets and say, well, there's five cherry woods that we need to make. Let's make all five of these cherry woods and knock them out right away. Um, and then work off the first list and go down. You know, there's just different ways you can look at it. and try breaking it down in your head, I guess, and try making it easier to get through. But at the end of the day, you just can't freak out. And you know, and, and touch on that, though, it's that's where, like, like we have really good teams and they really exhibit really good teamwork. If I'm there, I'll walk over and be like, hey, you have this many cocktails, this many cocktails, kind of play expo, um, you know, and just so yep. they don't have to keep looking at the tickets. Um, or somebody else will come over and do that usually if I'm not there and just make sure because they, they see that busy point. But, you know, I, I think I've said it to Andy. I'm like, I'm like, well, this ain't no thing. Just take your time. Yep. You know, just make sure it gets done right. That's bottom line. Yeah. Um, you know, there's you're in a bar. You're supposed to be having fun. And same thing in, in the kitchen because I've spent time in the kitchens before. And, like, you're supposed to be having fun. It gets stressful, but you just can't let it get to you. Um, but, you know, sometimes, like, one minute feels like ten minutes to you in that situation. So you're like, crap, but it's been ten minutes. Oh, no, actually, it's been a minute. Um, you know, uh, and I think... Yeah, the teams do a really, really good job of keeping themselves okay. I'm just going to do the work. Good communication always yeah. works. Yep. Just going to do the work. I'm going to just get it done, and that's just really all you can do. And, you know, like I tell all the new bartenders, before you get fast at this job, I just want to make sure you do it right the first time. So, like, if it takes you eight minutes and it only takes him three, I'd rather have the eight minutes and everything be correct than the three minutes and everything coming back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, final question. You guys might have already answered this at some point during the podcast, but I, I like to just – tie a bow on it what's your favorite part of being a part of the bar spirits cocktail industry uh my favorite part is being a part of people's exciting portion of their day um as i always say like always say, working in a bar is one of the greatest things you could do uh you're you're literally people's entertainment for the weekend you are the laugh, the cry, the the friend, the foe, you know, you're, you're the person that's always there and you're always the center of entertainment. And I always go, that's, that's kind of, in a way, really, really cool. You know, not most people when they go to work, they're like, oh, man, everybody's coming in to come see me tonight. You know, like, no, it really is true, though, when you work at a place like Proof where you, you get to walk in They're They're not really coming in to see me, but they are coming in to come see the place I am working at, which is really, really cool. So. So it's it's nice to be a part of the nightlife without being in the nightlife, I guess. So yeah, uh, mine's the people. You know, I I I, I just love people in general. Yes. Uh, not only they're fascinating, but I'm a social person. So uh, the conversations I get to have, like I'll have like a hundred types of different conversations on like a Friday night, and that's fun to me. 
and I get to try out new jokes and sometimes people tell me they're dumb, but <laughs> you know, I'm be like, perfect. That's what I was going for. Um, no, but you know, just like having fun with people, like Andrew said, like the amount of like engagements we've seen, the engagement parties, um, wedding anniversaries, the birthdays, the promotions, the celebrations, and the fact that they're coming to us to do that says a lot. And that means so a lot cool. to me yeah. so that we've been able to cultivate a atmosphere where people think, Oh my gosh, this is our, 40th birthday this is where i want to be for my 40th birthday or my 30th birthday or my wedding anniversary or you know my promotion like celebration so like to me that speaks volumes and it doesn't make it business to me it makes it personal so like you know like my god they're gonna spend their time their heart and money with me that get makes me feel responsible to make sure everything's perfect for him or mm -hmm. to the best of my ability mm -hmm. so here is what I love about proof and what I think makes it special. And my wife and I don't go out and drink a ton, but when we do, proof is usually at the top of the list. The last time we came in, I feel like, you know, when you go to a bar, you kind of, you know, your favorites and, and you get the favorites. Like I started off with a whiskey neat. She looked through the menu and got kind of a fruitier cocktail, but it was that next drink when the bartender came back and said, okay, you guys want another drink? And I was like, I want to something similar to what I just had, but also something a little, I didn't want to drink the same thing again. I wanted something a little bit different. So I was like, okay, I like angels envy. I can't like tell you specific flavor profiles or anything, but something similar to this. And they're like, I got you. And same thing with Sarah. They're like, what did you really like about that drink? Okay. I, I can work with that and create something specifically for you. The way that you're individualizing that experience for each customer, I think is what makes proof really special and that's why listeners, viewers, I would highly encourage you, whether you're a whiskey fanatic or a complete novice or you just like a good cocktail, go check out Proof, whether it's the Midtown location, whether you want to go see uh, Andy out at Proof 192, like you're going to have a good time. And it could be a celebration. It could just be a weekday night out. It could be whatever you want it to be. You guys have created something really special and well, I want to... Thank you for that, and thank you for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, like, I really pleasure. appreciate you taking your time. No, thank you for having us. Yeah. Really, it's a this was amazing. So, thank you. Yeah, this has been fun. Thanks, Omaha. Thanks for always eating and drinking with us. <laughs> <laughs>